Welcome to the Connect Your Health to Life coaching podcast. I'm your host, Seth Lusk. I'm a master certified self-image coach and empowered health coach with a decade-long background working in the health and wellness industry. If you're anything like me or the clients that I work with, then you're probably struggling with body image, self-image, or confidence issues. You're probably also trying to figure out why it is that you have these amazing desires for living your healthiest and most fulfilling life, but you can't seem to create consistent actions in your life to reflect those desires. So join me as we dive in deep on what it means to live a fulfilled and authentic life. We're going to look from the perspective of an empowered mindset and uncover reasons why you might be what's holding yourself back from living your most fulfilling life. I'm going to break through some of the biggest illusions and myths that we've all been taught to believe along the way, and I'm so excited to have you with me on this journey. So my only question for you is, are you ready to start living your most authentic and fulfilling life once and for all? Then let's get started, shall we? Hey everyone, welcome back to the Connect Your Health to Life coaching podcast. For those of you listening in for the first time, welcome and welcome. So this week, I've got yet again, and yes, I'm going to say it, I know you all are expecting it, an interesting topic for you. So as I say, and I will always keep saying, every week I have an interesting topic for you all. If it wasn't interesting for me, I probably wouldn't be putting it out. But I also know that it's interesting for you all because the topics that I'm picking are topics that people are telling me, number one, that they would love to hear about, or number two, they're topics that I'm hearing people talk about on social media constantly, and they're battling with each other about, and struggling about, and making posts about. So I know these topics are near and dear to y'all's hearts, which is why I am addressing them, putting them in this podcast as a coach for you all. And today's topic is, it's, again, also a huge, huge, huge topic. And I don't want you all to get the idea that this podcast today is designed to cover all things around this topic and that everything that I say in this topic is 100% the truth for every person on this planet or that it is all that there is to know about this topic because there is literally so much to say. And for every person, the way that this is going to apply to their life is going to be so unique to that individual that I would literally spend the rest of my life talking about this topic and still not scratch the surface of it. So my my goal here with, with talking about this is that I want to open up the conversation. I want to hit on some points that I'm seeing commonly coming up in conversations And in posts that I'm seeing on social media, things that I'm seeing in the news, people talking about this. And I want to address these directly. I want to offer some insight. I want to offer some uh, truth to some of the myths that are being thrown around out there and some of the misinformation that's out there. And I want to offer hope. I want to offer encouragement. And I want to offer support in reaching out to get help. If listening to this podcast causes you to think to yourself, this is something that sounds like me. This is something I've been dealing with and something that I don't want to keep dealing with on my own because obviously I'm not seeing where I need to go in in what direction with this to create any change. So it's time for me to reach out and ask for help and stop being ashamed or scared to ask for help. So that being said, the topic that we are approaching today, opening up the conversation around, is restrictive eating or food restriction and how it relates to mindset. So as a coach, I'm all about the mindset. You know that. I teach you all all about how the things that are happening out there, how they're going to affect you, how you're going to show up in your life with those circumstances is all about your mindset. The same thing applies to this topic of restrictive eating or dieting or you know food restriction. It's all about mindset. And my goal today is to open up the topic. I'm hoping some of you all have questions about this at the end. I'm hoping some of you all have some controversy, some scratching your head and be like, "Uh, but what if? I hope you have that. My goal is not to be like, everything that I say here is the only truth. And no, I I want you all to understand that 
there's so much to say here. There's so much back and forth. This is not a black and white topic. This is, there's a ton of gray area here. And so if you have questions, if you have ways in which I explain something here today, which you're like, mm, I don't know if that applies to me, speak up. Please do. Leave it in the comments. Hit me up on social media. Let's open up the conversation about this because, you know, I know that the moment that I put this podcast out there, there are going to be people that are going to be dealing with this in a way that I have not yet encountered before, or that other people have not encountered before, or ways in which the that me having to keep this under an hour long, I'm limited in how I can discuss this. And so I know I'm not going to address everyone's particular situation. So my goal is to open up this conversation. The goal is not to end this conversation with this podcast. It is to open it and to open doors for you to get out there and seek help for this. So that being said, let's jump in. All right. I think we're ready. So when it comes to food restriction, I think one of the first things that I want to do is to define the word restricting. What does that even mean? Because we talk about restricting as if it's a bad thing. And that's not bad that we talk about it as if it's a bad thing. Because it's, again, it's one of these words that you could look at as black or white. It could be good or bad, right or wrong. But there's also a ton of gray area in there in this word. And that's where I want to explore. So... Restricting. The definition simply means to put a limit on or to keep under control. Okay, there's that word control. <laughs> and I use it all of the time. You guys know I use it all of the time. Because there are many things in this world that we cannot control. And one of the biggest sources of suffering in this world that I see in humans is people trying to control things that are outside of their control. That's where the suffering comes from. The pain, the hurting, all of that's just part of being a human. That's just part of being a human. And as long as you continue to show up on this world as a human, part of the deal is pain, my friends. But pain doesn't have to be bad. Where pain becomes suffering is when we're trying to say things like, it shouldn't be happening. And then we go out there into the world and we try and control things in the world to keep pain from happening. That's where suffering comes in. So when pain becomes part of the deal and we can show up anyways with that pain and see it as being part of the good, part of the this what we call life and being able to create what we want to be here to create. So the word control, that's part of the definition of restricting. So the things that we can control are our beliefs, our thoughts, and our actions. Those are the only things that we can control. And with restrictive eating, and where I see eating disorder come out from this, this fact, this facet of control in the definition of restricting, is that there are many things in life that we cannot control. And eating disorders spring from this fact because what I see many times when I discuss particulars of people's eating disorders with them, or when I hear other people discussing it with other people, is that when they dig deep into where the eating disorder started, it stemmed from a desire of control or desire for control. See, wanting to have control in our lives is not entirely bad. It's not bad. Of course we want control. Control to us means security. It means safety. And that's really what we want to feel when we're, we're having this desire for control. But what we have to recognize is where we have control and where we don't. And how much control do we want to try and have in those areas? And how is that going to feel for us? These are the types of questions we want to ask ourselves. So having, wanting to have control or having control over our actions is not entirely bad. We don't want to live a life where we feel completely out of control of our actions. And actually, I feel like this is another source of suffering that I, I see in a lot of people is that they feel entirely out of control of their actions because they're so busy trying to control things out there that they don't have any control over that then their own actions become out of control because they're not taking control in the place in their life where they actually have it, which is in their beliefs, their thoughts, and their actions. So how this relates to eating disorders and restrictive eating is that what I see is that people 
that are trying to get control of their life and trying to control circumstances that they cannot control. And then they feel out of control in their life because they aren't taking control of their actions. So one obvious way that people see a benefit in trying to take control of their actions is that they will take the sense of control and put it into their eating and how it affects what their body looks like. And when they recognize that they can manipulate the way that they eat to change the way that their body looks, which changes the way that people look at them and talk to them and react to them, because we are an externally based society. That doesn't necessarily mean we have to be externally based or that I think it's healthy that we are externally based, but we are. And so people notice that. And they try and go about manipulating people's opinions of them by manipulating the appearance of their body, by manipulating the way that they eat. And so this is how we create the soup, the chaos, the mess, the cesspool in which eating disorders comes out of. So is wanting to control what we eat and how much we eat really a bad thing though? That's the question we need to ask here. Because yes, when we do it to try and change the way that our body looks, so that other people will like us more or look at us or we feel more we're more appealing this does lead to eating disorders and an unhealthy relationship with food in our body but the question becomes is trying to have control over what we eat and how much we eat in other words putting a limit on it or keeping under control is that really a bad thing because i'm going to say that the answer is a bit more complicated than a simple yes or no it's a lot more complicated than a simple yes or no. Because the fact of the matter is, no, it's not entirely bad to want to control what we eat. Because what I'm seeing today is that a lot of people are getting very sick from having no control over how they eat, having no awareness over why they eat the way that they eat and what they should, or not should, I don't want to use the word should there, what they could be eating to serve their body better and what they want to be eating to serve their body better based on what they want out of their body. So I'm going to say that the answer is no, but the answer is also yes. So the answer is actually it depends. It depends on a lot of different things. And I want to discuss that today. You see, where I see danger creeping in is not in wanting to have control over the foods how much to eat and what to eat. That's not where the danger creeps in. The danger creeps in with the motivation. The motivation behind the control. That's where I see, you know, the the deciding factor in whether or not having awareness and control over what you eat becomes disordered eating or becomes healthy eating. It's all in the motivation, my friends. And when the motivation becomes the way that the person sees their body in either shape, size, or their willingness to love and accept their body, then this is where I see an unhealthy way that restrictive eating patterns can sl slip into a person's life. Restrictive eating and whether or not it is healthy is all about mindset. That's, that's really what it's all about. It's not really about the particular foods that a person eats. With a caveat to that being, until it gets to the point where if a person is choosing not to eat specific foods, to the point that it's creating deficiencies in their body. Many of you know that I eat ketogenic, and I don't even like using the word ketogenic. I eat a high healthy fat, low carbohydrate diet, which means that I restrict, technically, I restrict my carbohydrate intake, but I don't see it even as a restriction because it's not having harmful effects in my body. My body is very healthy. And I make sure that I get enough carbohydrates that my body stays healthy, but not more than that. Because when I eat more than that, I don't feel good. I don't feel healthy. I don't feel energetic. I don't feel clear in my mind. I don't feel like I'm able to show up in my life as the version of me that I know that I am. Now, when I first started eating ketogenic, it was all about my body shape, my body size. And I started developing some deficiencies. I started developing some very unhealthy patterns eating ketogenic because it was all about trying to get a little bit skinnier, a little bit leaner, cut out the carbohydrates even a little bit more to the point where I was restricting my carbohydrates to the point where I was over-exercising and 
underutilizing carbohydrates for what they are actually there for. Because you see, with the ketogenic diet, the whole point is to get insulin, blood glucose, um, and leptin levels, all of our, our hunger and satiety hormones, in a level of balance with our body again. It's all about using carbohydrates as a lever for what they're actually there for. You see, carbohydrates help our body to gain weight. They help our body to store weight, which is our body would not have the process of being able to store weight if it was an unhealthy process. Where it becomes unhealthy is when we're always in a state of storage, always in a state of gaining. Our body is not designed to always be in a state of that, but our body is also not designed to always be in a state of weight loss. That's also very dangerous and scary for our body and unhealthy for it. So when I first approached eating ketogenic and it was all about just getting leaner and leaner and leaner, my body was giving me all of the signals of, hey, buddy, listen, you're lean enough. You don't need to be any leaner. And now I'm getting scared that you're trying to kill us. And my body started fighting me back on it. And then I fought my body. And then my body fought back and then I fought my body, which led to a lot of very unhealthy patterns with food and how I was looking at my body, how I was relating to my body, and how I was speaking to my body. And when I recognized that, I was able to step back from that, stop looking at carbohydrates as being evil, and start seeing them as being what they are for in my diet, how much of those I actually need based on how much I exercise, Based on, you know, how, what do I want to, what, what weight do, does my body feel good at? Not weight do I want to be at because this is what the, the latest men's health magazine is telling me, oh, be this percentage body fat. But what weight do I actually feel good at? What body fat percentage do I actually feel the most energetic, the most alive, the most vibrant, the most vital? And being there. How much carbohydrate do I need to eat to make sure I stay there? How much do I need to restrict to make sure that I don't get up to the body fat percentage where I start feeling lethargic, where I start feeling bloated and uncomfortable and my organs start to feel like they're not getting as much blood flow? You know, the, this is the, the relationship that I had to get into to reconnect with my body and recognize it was wanting to work for me. It was wanting to work with me and I was working against it. So where restrictive eating becomes unhealthy is in the mindset because it wasn't that eating ketogenic was unhealthy for me. But when my reason why I was eating ketogenic became because I want to be lean so that people see that I'm fit, so that people will hire me as a personal trainer and as a coach, then it became unhealthy. When the idea of good and bad food crept in, like carbohydrates are evil and bad, that's when it started becoming unhealthy for me. So I want to talk about that, this idea of good versus bad foods, because I think we need to look at this as a society, because here's the thing. It's not that there are good and bad foods, but, 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 there's a huge but there because I think a lot of people take this idea that there's no such thing as a good or bad food as being, oh, that means I can just eat whatever I want, right? Because there's no such thing as a good or bad food. There is a huge caveat to this because a lot of the things that we label as food today in the 21st century in these plastic packaged, preservative filled junk crap that we put in our body, a lot of those things that we label as foods aren't actually food. They're a bunch of mixed up chemicals with some food substances mixed in there that make it edible. But is that really what we want to call food? And that's not to say, though, that if I'm in a position where I'm in the middle of a desert and I'm about to die if I don't eat something, and I happen to come across a can of Pringles, that I'm not going to open that can of Pringles and eat it and get the calories out of it. Because at that point in time, it's all about the calories to stay alive. So this is the important thing that we need to look at. A lot of the things that we're shoving in our mouth and labeling as food, do we really want to label those as food? I would label these things as like a last ditch resort for like when I'm starving to death and about to die if I don't get some calories in. Yeah, sure, I might put the stuff in my mouth, but I wouldn't label that as food. I call food things that are natural, things that come from the planet, come from earth, that are there to nourish my body, to support my health. And there are carbohydrates in some of those foods. And I put those into context. How much of those do I need? How much is natural to eat? You know, when we look at fruits, fruits are natural. Those come from the earth. So we look at fruits as being a health food. But, you know, on the ketogenic diet, we restrict fruit. 
And that's not because fruit's bad. And I think that we can get into this negotiation of whether or not fruit is good or bad, but that's not the point. The point is the context of the fruit. Because you see, in the 21st century, we have fruits available to us that would have, number one, I live in Switzerland. Bananas would never be available to me in Switzerland, naturally speaking. Bananas don't grow here. So even the fact that bananas are available to me here in Switzerland is already a bit unnatural. And then we have to think about the fact that bananas, even in the places where bananas grow, they don't grow all year round. They grow during a certain season. And naturally speaking, we would only come across bananas during that season. And we would only come across the bananas that animals hadn't already eaten or that hadn't rotten, rotted. But now we're growing these bananas specifically in certain areas. We're, try, we're finding ways to grow them all year round, and we're shipping them everywhere in the world, which is already a bit unnatural. So we have to put that into context when we're eating these foods. Because yes, I consider a banana food, but that doesn't mean that I have to eat a banana every day, because that, I would say, is unnatural. It's not natural. I also have to look at my genetics. I have to look at, you know, where do I come from? What is my heritage? Would the people that I ancestrally come down from in lineage, would they have ever eaten bananas naturally? Maybe, maybe not. I, I would need to look into that. We all need to look into that. And then understand in context what foods are more natural for our bodies, which ones would not be. And if, if we want to eat foods that aren't necessarily natural, it's not that I'm going to say bananas are evil and that I will never eat a banana. But I'm not going to see bananas as a, a regular food source for me. There are plenty of other ways that I can get the nutrients that are in a banana into my life in foods that grow naturally here in Switzerland. And in context of when they grow, I can find those ways. And this is what restrictive eating would look like in a healthy way. So we really need to look at this, the way what we label as food as a society first, before we start looking at what is good food, what is bad food. I personally think these processed vegetable oils that we put on the, on the grocery shelves need to go away. I would, can, I would call those bad. There's no context in which those foods serve our body. They're full of... Uh, they're full of rancid omega-6 fatty acids that go into our body and just cause inflammation. Are they calories? Sure, they are calories. If I was dying and the only only source of calories that I had was a bottle of, of canola oil, would I take a spoonful of it? Probably to stay alive. But is that something that I want to be putting in my body in any context if I have the option? No, the answer is no. And do we have other options for getting fat sources in in a healthy way that don't involve us going through these chemically processed, oxidized vegetable fats? Yes, there are. And we need to open up the discussion around that and start talking about that. But anyways, so the discussion of good or bad foods. First, before we even get into that, we need to start looking at what we even label as food today and put food into context for what it's here for. Because you see, here's the other... Here's the a part of that that I think we struggle with, with being able to put food into context. A lot of us see food as our source of happiness, joy, and entertainment. And this leads to a lot of feelings of deprivation and restriction when a person attempts to get their eating habits under control to maintain health in their life. When people begin their journey of wanting to eat healthy, and they start recognizing all of the foods that they're eating that are creating unhealth in their body, but they've also been taught to see food as a source of comfort in difficult emotional situations. They've been taught to see food as the best way to celebrate anything that's happy in their life. I want you all to understand I'm not trying to say that food can't be comfort and that it can't be used as a way to celebrate. But where our biggest struggle lies today is putting this into context. And to recognizing that when we start to want to eat healthy and start to recognize the foods that we're putting into our body or the substances that we're putting into our body that really aren't foods, that are not serving our body, and we want to start putting those under control, we need to recognize where that feeling of deprivation and restriction comes from. A lot of it can come from the fact that we're doing it to try and change our body shape because we don't love our bodies. That's a reason to feel restricted and deprived. 
Another reason why a lot of pe- people feel this feeling of deprivation when they start to get control over their eating habits is because they've been taught to see food as their source of happiness and joy and comfort in life. You see, food is here to give us energy and health and nutrients that our body needs to grow and function properly. And that's not to say that it can't be something that we consume during celebrations because when we are celebrating, we're celebrating life. We're celebrating our health. We're celebrating the fact that we are here in these bodies and enjoying this life, this temporary place of being on this planet until whatever happens when we leave this body. We're here to celebrate that. And food can be a part of that. But food does not become the source of the celebration, the source of the joy in the celebration. We have to remember what we're celebrating and to recognize that, yes, food can be a tool that we use during that celebration, but it's not the source of the joy of the celebration in life. We need to remember that. Food is here to give us energy, health, and nutrients. And in the 21st century, many of the things that we label foods are simply calories mixed with chemicals. And they don't nourish our bodies. They don't support our health. But we've been taught to consume them as a way to celebrate and to comfort ourselves. And so for a lot of people, when they want to start eating healthy, this is a huge source of struggle for them. And this is why I recommend working with a coach to get to the bottom of this is because really the reason why you're struggling with is that because there are some deeply programmed thoughts and beliefs surrounding your relationship to your body and food that you're not aware of. That you're not looking at and a coach will help you see those and help you become aware of them and help you get back into a position of power and love and health when it comes to your relationship to food in your body which brings me to the next struggle that i see people coming into when it comes to this idea of restrictive eating and wanting to get control of their eating patterns again and it has to do with hunger signals and urges You see, we also live in a culture today that is all about instant gratification. We have Instagram, for instance. I mean, we so so many things are instant. We we expect for clothes that we order online to arrive the next day now. I want you all to understand that in my lifetime, when I was first growing up, the idea of ordering food clothes through a catalog was already a bit insane. The fact that we could do that was already, whoa, mind blowing. And we might get it a month or two later. And that was so cool to us. And now we are just 30 years later, just 30 years later, we expect for things to be arriving the next day. And when they can't arrive the next day, we're like, oh, that's too long. Or we'll order clothes through someone else that we don't even really want just because they can get it to us the next day. My friends, we have jumped into this culture where we are so stuck on the idea that I need the happiness, I need the comfort, and I need it now. If I'm feeling uncomfortable, something is wrong, and I need something to get rid of the discomfort right now as fast as possible. And I want you all to understand that this has led to so many problematic behaviors, so many that I I don't want to get into today, but the one that we're going to discuss today is the fact that people use food as a source of that instant gratification as a source of that instant relief of the discomfort that they're facing. We have so many different buffering behaviors. And what I mean by buffering behaviors are things that we do to try and get instant relief from discomfort. Because we're unwilling to see that discomfort is part of the deal of being human. It doesn't mean there's something wrong and we don't need to get away from it as fast as possible. Discomfort is part of the deal. Discomfort is part of our growth. Discomfort is part of the process of learning what we want to learn in this life. And the more we try and escape it, the more we make it wrong, the more we suffer when we do experience it, and the more we suffer trying to get rid of it and believing that it shouldn't be there. But then, So then every time it comes back, it comes back more intense, and we believe even more that it shouldn't be there. And so we create this pattern of suffering in our life by trying to constantly buffer away that discomfort. And the fact of the matter is, and what I want to talk about today, is that we're doing it with food also. We do it with alcohol, we do it with shopping, we do it with gambling, we do it with drugs, we do it with television, we do it with sleep, we do it with exercise, but we also do it with food. So my friends, one of the ways in which I see this this pattern of not being able to get food under control in a healthy way is that people eat foods to avoid feeling uncomfortable feelings. 
Whether it be stress, sadness, anger, disappointment, anxiety, the list can go on and on of of emotions that people don't want to experience because they've been taught to believe that they're wrong and that experiencing them is wrong and that that when you experience them, the goal is to get rid of it as fast as possible. So people will turn so quickly to so many different behaviors to immediately relieve that uncomfortable feeling. And one of those is what I call the snack attack. (laughs) We use the snack attack as a way to distract ourselves from processing emotions. And this leads to so many different issues in our mental and physical health and leads to so much disordered eating, the binge eating, the overeating, the, the emotional eating that I've talked about before. And this leads to so many issues in our physical health. Because you see, the body is not designed to be in a constant state of digestion consumption. It's not. It it also needs to break down all of the food that you're putting in your mouth. And that takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy from our body to do that. And our body needs a break from that sometimes. It does. It really does. And when we use that as a way to resist ourselves to lose weight and look skinny and to look lean, then that idea of needing that break from digesting food and eating food can also become disordered eating. But what I want to talk about right now in this moment is the fact that our body does biologically need a break from eating to be healthy. It does. Digestion takes a lot of energy from our body. And it's actually a stressful process. It's a healthy stress. It is a eustress. But when eustress is constant, then that becomes an unhealthy pattern in our body. And it can become distress. When that eustress becomes so intense and it's constant, it can become distress for our body. So another thing that I want to offer, or just talk to you, or not talk to you about, another thing I want to point out is that Constantly eating food stimulates inflammation in the body, which also leads to a stress response in the body. When we're constantly eating, our body is also kind of trying to be like, what the hell is wrong here? Are we like about to go into a famine? Do we? Your, your body is also thinking something is wrong when we're constantly eating food and putting it under this, this small amount of inflammation that eating food would cause, which would be a healthy inflammation because it's supposed to come and then go, but we're keeping it constant. So then the body thinks there's something really wrong and our body isn't able to get into its natural rhythm or state of food consumption, digestion, energy storage, and then rest and then energy usage. Instead, what I see is that people slip into the state of constant energy storage, digestion, and inflammation, or they go into resistance of their body because they want to get skinny and ripped, and they're in a constant state of energy usage with nothing coming back in. So when I begin working with clients on their eating habits, what I'm encountering almost 100% of the time is that they don't recognize real hunger or society or satiety signals anymore, like at all in their body. They have no clue what that means on either end of the spectrum here, either the people that can't stop overeating or the people that can't stop starving themselves because they're afraid of gaining weight. Neither one of these groups of people recognize true hunger and satiety signals in their body because they've been in resistance to their bodies for so long. The people that are overeating, they know the feeling of having an urge to eat and having low blood sugar because their hormones are all out of whack and can't regulate blood sugar and can't regulate using fat when blood sugar gets to a healthy level as fuel. So they recognize that, but they don't actually recognize real hunger signals, what the body is saying. You know, blood sugar dropping... We, we see that now because we're such a carbohydrate-rich society in our diet, and, and this is why I personally as- ascribe to a ketogenic diet. Low blood sugar doesn't mean we have to eat. The problem is, is that many of our bodies can't switch over to using fat for fuel efficiently because we've been on such a glucose high and insulin high for so long that when our blood sugar gets low, our body is like, what the hell, man? We're going to die. We're going to die because there's no blood sugar. Because it doesn't know to look around at all the body fat that's stored. It's literally sitting in the middle of an all-you-can-eat buffet and saying, I'm starving to death. Someone please bring me food. It's an emergency. I'm hungry. You're literally laying on the floor in the middle of an all-you-can-eat buffet, which is the stored body fat, and starving to death. That's what the body feels like. So we need 
to address that and and stop seeing this urge to eat and this low blood sugar feeling as being a, oh, it's time to eat. We need to start getting the body back into a state of hormone regulation, of being connected to our body and recognizing what a true hunger signal feels like. And we're not going to get there if we're constantly giving in to urges to eat, which is totally different than feeling actually hungry. And what I recognize so many times is that when I ask people, can you describe what being hungry feels like? And they tell me it's an urge. They're not actually hungry. Or when people say, oh my God, I'm starving. I'm like, really? So what does that feel like in your body? And what they describe to me is this panicking urge to eat. It's not that they're actually hungry. And when I get them to the point where their hormones are balanced and they can recognize true hunger signals in their body, it amazes them. It amazes them how much easier it is to decide when am I going to eat? How much am I going to eat? How much do I need? What feels good in my body? And to just food loses all of its power over them. They become the person that decides all of that versus the food controlling them. Which brings me to my next point that I just mentioned here. Finding the foods that feel good in your body is the next step after we, we recognize true hunger signals. And when we, when we want to begin eating healthy, this is a huge and important step. But I also need you all to recognize that there is a difference here between foods that feel good in your body. And again, when we go back to this idea of urges to eat, a lot of times people will be like, oh, but when I eat a candy bar, I feel good. And I'm like, well, describe what does feel good mean? What do you mean you feel good when you eat a candy bar? And what they describe to me is relief. What they describe to me is relief. And I know some of you all be like, okay, so they feel good. That's relief. Relief is good. Let me, let me tell you here what this means. Relief means that they don't actually feel good. Relief means that they were making themselves feel so anxious and scared and stressed out about the fact that they're not eating a candy bar right now and oh my god, I need to be eating a candy bar. You know that, that, whole, that whole crazy chaos that goes on in our head when we're sitting there looking at this Snickers bar in front of us and we're like, why am I not eating that yet? Oh my god, can I not eat it? Should I eat it? And we, we create all this emotional drama in our heads about the candy bar. And the fact of the matter is our body doesn't need the candy bar. The body is totally chill. It's got plenty of energy. It's, it's got plenty of fat that you've stored that it could start using for energy. It, it's totally chill. But in your brain, in your mind, you have this conversation of total chaos and drama going on. And what I hear people describing to me when they say, oh yeah, but when I eat the ice cream, when I eat the chocolate bar, when I eat the brownie, when I eat the cake, I feel good. And then I say, describe feeling good to me. And what they describe is relief. Relief from that urge. Relief from that chaos. Release from, relief from that dramatic, huge, catastrophic conversation going on in their mind surrounding that one little food item that they're giving so much power to. And so what I want to recognize is that when we talk about foods that feel good in the body, there needs to be an understanding of the difference between these two. There is a difference between the relief of giving into an urge and foods that feel good in the body. You see, when we eat foods that feel good, we eat foods that, that make us feel energetic, that make us feel healthy and vital, that make us feel as if we've just nourished our body. We've just given it everything that it needs to grow, to survive, to live, to have energy, to show up and create the things that we were wanting to create in our life. That's when food feels good in the body. So for instance, for me, when I have my first meal of the day, what feels good in my body is something very light, something that has lots of energy in it, but that's light, that has lots of nutrients in it, but that feels light in my stomach. I don't want to be walking around during the day with 
a ton of heavy stuff in my stomach that my body is trying to digest and break down, that happens later in the day. That's my dinner meal. Because then I'm going to be laying around and feeling lazy anyways and resting for the night and being proud of everything that I did and let my body digest and rest and break it down and repair itself from all of the the activity that I've done for the day. That's my dinner meal. But my breakfast meal is going to be something that's energy-packed, nutrient-dense, and light in my digestive system. Because I want to get out there and I want to be in my my day and full of energy to show up for my clients, to show up for my life. I don't want to be busy feeling bloated and tired and trying to digest a bunch of food. (laughs) So I recognize this in my body. And I recognize the foods that I can eat in the morning that aren't going to make me feel bloated and full and tired and lethargic and like my body is spending so much energy trying to digest. I know what feel good the what foods feel good for me there and this is what i mean by foods that feel good and we have to find the ones that work for us because for every person it's going to be a little bit different it's and this is the other side of this that i think we get trapped in is that in this right wrong good bad society that we teach ourselves we're always looking for well what's the right way to eat well the truth is it depends on you and your body Your body is not going to respond the same way to foods that mine does. So while me and you could both be eating quote-unquote ketogenic, or what I would call high high healthy fat, low carbohydrate, we would be eating different foods to achieve that goal of health. So we want to take the time to reconnect with our bodies and find the foods that feel good in our bodies, that help us feel energetic and vital and good and make us, you know, feel good. Yeah, that's the goal. The goal is feeling good in the body. And that doesn't mean feeling good emotionally. Because when we think that, what we think is that when we're not feeling good emotionally, when we are experiencing an emotion that we don't want to experience, we just need to eat a food to get rid of that emotion. And so we get into that cycle of emotional eating, eating chocolate to get an oxytocin boost when we're in a bad mood. That's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about eating food that feels good in our body. We also need to be willing to see all of our emotions and experience all of those emotions. So when we're talking about feeling good, I'm talking about feeling good physically in the body. The emotional level of of our health, we deal with that differently. We deal with that, we process that separately. We're not processing that with food anymore. Okay? So... The next thing I want to address is this idea of eating disorders and restrictive eating and diets. So this is a sensitive area to approach. So what I want to say here, anyone out there listening that has struggled with an eating disorder, what I'm about to say here only scratches the surface of how eating disorders can once we've struggled with one, they can disrupt our ability to create a healthy eating plan in our life. And the reason why is because when we've created a relationship with food that is so disordered, a lot of times trying to eat healthy becomes another way of disordered eating. This is a part of this discussion that is very near and dear to my heart, my friends. I have battled with eating disorders for over a decade, over a decade, with binge eating. I struggled with that. I struggled with binge eating. I struggled with overeating. I struggled with fasting to the point that I was starving my body. I have struggled with exercise bulimia using exercise as a way to punish myself for what I just overate. So my friends, when I, when I tell you that I understand the battle with eating disorders, I understand the complexity, but here's what I I want you to understand is that the complexity is within your power. It is within your power, but you're not going to find your power in that situation, as long as you're looking out there to the diet and to the behavior level to create the change that you're wanting to look at. Many people struggling with eating disorders see their body as something that they have to fight against when it comes to food. People with eating disorders see food as a way to either reward or punish their body. 
on whether or not it cooperated with them or whether or not it didn't do what they think it should have done for them for the day. I know people who see food as something that they have to earn their worth to be able to eat through ex- like extremely strenuous exercise. I know people who simply see food as a way to manipulate the shape and weight of their body. And the list can go on and on and on, my friends, of ways to look at food in an unhealthy and toxic way with an eating disorder. It goes on and on, my friends, and I am there with you. I know what it's like to see food in this way. But what I want to offer you is that you can't just look at changing the food if you want to change that. You have to change your relationship with food, which requires to dive into the mindset there. Get a coach. Get a therapist. I promise you this is something you want to work on. And it's nothing to be ashamed of because I also promise you that there are tons of people around you that are struggling with the same thing who are afraid to speak up and talk about it and do something about it. You could be their biggest inspiration. You could be the person that shows them it's okay to get help. Get help with this. It's worth the investment in therapy or a coach. Because until you get this under control in your life, everything else is going to remain out of control. Because if your body is disordered, then trying to show up in your life in an orderly way is going to be impossible for you. It's going to be impossible for you. Your body can't give you what it has to give to help you show up in your life and create what it is that you're here to want to create if it's suffering and struggling with trying to figure out what the hell to do with your destructive eating patterns and your destructive relationship with it. The list of ways in which people can create toxic relationships with food is about as diverse as the number of people struggling with disordered eating patterns on this planet. And that number is huge, huge, my friends. So what that means is that you need to get personal help. Stop thinking that reading a book is going to help you. Stop thinking that some online course that you're going to listen to a video and finally have an aha revelation that's going to help you. That's No, my friends, you need to get someone who can sit down with you and discuss with you how you developed this toxic relationship with food in your body and find your solution to come out of it, not someone else's solution that worked for them. And this is what I love about coaching Because my solution of how I came out of my disordered eating isn't going to be the solution for you. And I will help you find your solution. I'm not going to give you mine. My solution won't work for you. Now, some of the steps that I took are going to look a little bit similar. But how you're going to do it is going to be completely different. And that's what a coach is there to help you do. Is to find those steps and how they're going to look in your life. And how you're going to show up with power through those steps. And this is why eating disorders feel so difficult for people to overcome is because every person has their own unique way that they developed that eating disorder. And therefore, it's going to take their own unique way to find their way out of that disorder. But this is not bad news because this also means that the solution is within you, the person that is struggling. It's within you. You're the one that created the disorder, and that's not to feel guilt or shame. Don't slip into guilt or shame there. We don't need to feel guilty or ashamed about it. We need to recognize the empowerment in that statement. You're the one that created this disordered eating, and you did it for good reasons. And as a coach, I will discuss those reasons with you, because for every person, the reason why they created it is so different. But every person, what I find is that the reason why they started, they started the disordered eating was usually a desire for love, a desire for security, a desire for feeling like life wasn't going to kill them. So you are the one that created this disordered eating, which means that you are the one that has the power inside of you to get out of it. The coach is not going to give you the power. The coach is going to simply guide you to your power, guide you to your way help you find it. You see, a lot of times when we're in these struggles, we're so close to the the, the struggles, we're so close to the the self-talk, we're so close to the beliefs and the thoughts and the disordered behaviors that we can't get a broad enough picture to find a way out of it. We just keep doing the same loops and it feels relentlessly hopeless. And what I want you all to recognize is that this disordered eating spectrum is huge. From restrictive eating to people that are struggling with being able to just stop eating. 
And I don't mean stop eating like permanently, but I mean like they literally cannot stop eating. They just have to constantly be eating. The range of the disorder on the spectrum is huge, my friends, which tells you that the ways that people got into these disorders is also vastly unique and huge. So remember when I said that people that are struggling with overeating don't recognize their hunger signals. This doesn't just apply to people that are overconsuming. Because you see, what I also see is that people that have disordered eating patterns that they've hidden by by calling, you know, wanting to eat healthy, or sometimes people will label their, their starving themselves as intermittent fasting. And this is why going into these things before dealing with the mindset is really a terrible idea. What I find is that people that use these tools of quote-unquote restrictive eating, healthy eating, and intermittent fasting as ways to punish their body and starve themselves, they've also lost their way to recognize their hunger signals. They've become so good at ignoring hunger signals that they no longer know what a true hunger signal is anymore. This They've literally programmed into themselves how to ignore hunger. And they literally believe that they are not hungry when in fact that they are hungry. Because they see being hungry as when they finally, you know, have done their the, the amount of punishing to their body that they need to for the day. And then they're like, okay, I've done all of that, so now I'm allowed to eat. That's when they see, like, that's when I'm hungry. Is when I've gotten all of this out of the way. All of these fears of being fat and all these fears of not looking sexy enough and not looking lean enough. Once I've gotten all of those out of the way for, for today and I'm no longer worrying about those things, that lack of worry becomes what they see as being hungry. So they've also lost track of their ability to recognize their hunger signals. And this is why reconnecting with the body is so important to take as the first step, dealing with the mindset and reconnecting with the body in a healthy way so that we can approach healthy eating in a way that isn't in resistance to you and your body, but it's in a way to serve you and your body. And what I see when, when people begin this journey of wanting to overcome their disordered eating patterns Every time, it's always, I, I have people come to me and they're, they're wanting to begin eating healthy again. And it's always these questions. What do I eat? How much do I exercise? What kind of exercise should I be doing? What supplements do I need to be taking? What treatments do I need to try? Have you heard of this treatment? Do you think it's any good? Like these are the kind of questions that people come to me with. And I sit there and I allow them to ask me the questions. And then I say, I'm glad that you're curious here, but you're asking me the wrong questions. These are not the questions that are going to get you to where you're telling me you want to go. All of these questions focus on changing behavior at the behavior level. And what do we know about behavior? I've talked about this when I've talked about the thought model so many times in my past episodes. Our behaviors come from emotions and our understanding of those emotions and having emotional responsibility, which we can't have until we understand where those emotions come from, which means we recognize that emotions come from a thought. And that those thoughts come from a belief. And that those thoughts and beliefs are optional. And that circumstances are 100% neutral until we have a thought or belief about them. So, my friends, if we're trying to change behaviors at the behavior level, then guess what? All of those thoughts and beliefs that are driving those emotional patterns that we're not responsible in are still there. And it's just a matter of time before you can't hold the beach ball under the water anymore and it explodes to the surface and erupts in a new way of disordered eating or a new way of buffering it away. Maybe you stop using food and you start using alcohol or drugs or shopping or gambling or television instead as a way to deal with this inability to look at your beliefs, your thoughts, and become emotionally responsible. So my friends, if you really want to get a handle on this, it's going to require that you stop giving into this message that our society gives us today, that the goal is to hurry up and get there and that you'll feel better when you get there. That's not it. You have to stop trying to hurry up and get there. And you have to be willing to see yourself and your life as it is right now. And instead of thinking, I need to hurry up and get away from this, 
recognize that part of your journey is being in that life and recognizing your power in creating it. So you can then recognize your power to be able to create the life that you're wanting to live. Not in resistance to the life that you've already created, but because of the life that you've already created, you see your power to create the new life that you're wanting to live. But my friends, you'll never get there if you're in this rush to change at the behavior level simply. And then you're constantly building your new house on this foundation that is cracked and crumbling. And guess what? The house will keep on falling down. We have to look at the, the foundation. We have to look at the health of the foundation first, my friends. Otherwise, every house you build on that foundation is bound to fall. You keep push, pushing the beach ball back under the water. It's going to keep coming back up to the surface until you open it up and look inside and find the air that's in there and let it all out and see it. See it for what it is. Untangle it and recognize your power. Okay? So if you're concerned that you may have some patterns of restrictive eating, that is, uh, and what I mean by that is unhealthy patterns of restrictive eating. So restrictive eating that's in resistance to your body, that is harming you. I want you, here are some signs that you can recognize that it's time to get some help. Okay, it's time to stop ignoring this and wondering whether or not you are, you have a disordered eating pattern and start getting some help here. So some signs and this is not an exhaustive list. These are just some big ones. If your reason why you're restricting the foods that you're eating is because you want your body to look a certain way, that's a sign. If you are willing to feel tired, unwell, and sick, if it means that your body will look a certain way, be a certain size, or weight, if you're willing to do all of that so that you can have that in the end, this is a sign. And I want to caveat this with this, my friends, a lot of people that are very sugar addicted and have disordered hormones in their body, when they start eating a high fat, low carbohydrate diet to kind of get their hormones back under control, they will go through a period of a week or two of not feeling their best. But this is the body trying to rebalance itself. That's different than literally just making yourself feel sick because, oh, I'm going to look good in the end. You know, sometimes in order to get the body back into order, it has to go through a period of where it might not feel its best. But remember, the goal in the end is to create health, not to look skinny. Okay, so there's a reason why we're doing this. Okay, so I want—I just want to offer that little caveat there. So another sign is that you feel very anxious around food or thinking about food or when you think about eating. If you recognize anxiety and stress coming up when it comes to food, this is a sign that you have some disordered eating patterns in your life and they need to be addressed. Another sign is that you avoid events in which you know there will be food involved. That's a huge sign. If you are avoiding events in which food will be involved, that is a huge sign that you have a disordered eating pattern. If you are experiencing major mood swings or shifts um, to either depression or anxiety since beginning to try and control your eating, that's a sign that this is an unhealthy disordered eating pattern. If you feel very defensive about your eating practices, and you may even find yourself snapping at people who show concern about it or ask about them, that's a sign that you have a very unhealthy disordered eating pattern, okay? So... These are, like I said, just a few signs to pay attention to, but they are big ones. So if you notice any of these, then now may be a good time to talk to someone about it. Get some help. There's no shame here. And remember, there are other people around you struggling with this, and you could be the person that inspires them to also get help by being the person that sets the example and says, you know what? No, I'm not putting up with this anymore. I'm not letting myself be a victim of myself anymore. I am going to step back into my seat of power in my life my seat of authority in my life, my seat of sovereignty in my life. Do that for you and to be an example to the people around you. If you're someone who is struggling with binge eating or overeating disorders, but you fear that going into a healthy eating pattern may lead to an unhealthy restrictive eating pattern, or maybe you're concerned of feeling deprived or restricted, because you know people that have struggled with eating disorders. I encourage you also to find someone who you trust, preferably a coach or a therapist, who you can have help guide you into a relationship of healing with your food and your body before you start trying to change the foods themselves. 
If you have that fear of starting to eat healthy because you're afraid that you're going to feel deprived, then don't start with the food. Start with talking with someone about your relationship to food and to your body. And then from there, create a plan with that person to start changing the foods that you're eating. Don't immediately think, oh, I need to hurry up and change this because I I need to hurry up, otherwise I'm not going to do it. Stop doing that to yourself. Stop putting yourself through that cycle. Get some help. I promise. I promise coaching works. It does. Ask any of my clients who have worked with me. It really does work. Remember that eating healthy and choosing not to eat certain foods does not have to be focused on restriction and deprivation. While the definition here falls under restriction because we are putting a limit and controlling the foods that we eat, the focus that we have here is on freedom, freedom to feel healthier, freedom to not have food having power over you in your life, and instead having the sovereignty in your life of choosing the foods that serve you and make you or help you feel your best and show up in your life the way you want to. So this idea of quote unquote restricting our food becomes about freedom when we do it from the space of I want to feel my best in my body. So having a healthy relationship with food in your body, it's the most empowering thing. You get back your time, the time that you spend worrying about what to eat and what not to eat. And I think this all becomes so clear and obvious. It all becomes so clear and obvious when you've dealt with the mindset behind the food. So you don't have to spend hours worrying about what to eat and what not to eat. You can have your time back that you spend sitting in shame and guilt because you don't understand why it is that you're eating what you're eating and that it doesn't feel good in your body and that you can't stop eating and that you keep gaining weight and gaining weight and gaining weight and you don't understand why. You can stop spending time sitting in that guilt and shame and beating yourself up and going to the gym for hours and beating yourself up and trying diet after diet after diet and beating yourself up. You get all of that time back and my friends... That right there in and of itself is worth the investment. On top of the fact, think of all the money you're spending on doctor's bills because you're constantly feeling sick and tired. Because believe it or not, a healthy body with a healthy diet doesn't get sick so often. You don't have all of that pain, all of that not understood disease. Why do I feel so tired? Why am I not able to get out of bed? Why do I feel so depressed? Why do I feel so anxious? And that's not to say that every person that feels anxious or depressed that needs to go on medication, it's because of an eating disorder. So I don't want to suggest that, but a healthy diet helps with this. Okay. But a healthy relationship with food starts with a healthy relationship with our mind and body. And I know you want to rush to hurry up and changing the foods, and that's okay. That's okay that you have that desire. We don't need to make that desire wrong, but we can notice where this desire comes from. It comes from a social pressure, and that we don't want to give society that kind of power over us. We don't have to. We can recognize that that desire is there, and then see it, allow it to be there, and then shift our focus in another direction. We don't have to make that desire to hurry up and change wrong, But we can recognize that that desire to hurry up and change comes from something that we believed that we don't want to believe in anymore. And that's okay that that belief is still there. We're about to start creating evidence to show that belief that we don't have to believe it anymore. We don't have to believe it anymore. It's not that we have to make it wrong, but we don't have to believe it anymore if we don't want to. And to be truth, truth be told, we don't want to believe it. But we have to figure out why we don't want to believe it first and why we believed it in the first place. Changing your body will not make you love it more. Not when you changed it because you couldn't offer it love. So we need to learn to reconnect to the body first and love it first. Because your body was only doing what it was designed to do with the foods that you fed it. So stop punishing it. Stop sending it messages of hate and disgust. Stop talking to it like it's working against you and broken and recognize what you've been feeding it, what you've been telling it, what you've been doing to it, and start offering it love for having been there for you, for having done its best to try and keep you as healthy as it could with all of the messages and you were sending it and all of the, the, the stuff you were putting in your mouth and all of the things that you were doing to it. Start loving it. Start learning to love that body for being there for you all of this time. And then we can start addressing the food and the exercise 
I encourage you, if this sounds like a journey that you want to take, don't do it alone. Get a coach, get a therapist. You are powerful enough to do this. It's not that you need someone else to make you powerful enough to do this. But as I said earlier, the therapist and the coach is there to offer perspective and objectivity, to help you see your blind spots so that you can have your power back in those areas the areas in which you've allowed yourself to become unaware. The coach is there to guide you back to those places of power, back to those places of love and compassion, back to those places of truth and trust with yourself, your body, and with food. That's what the coach is there for. So don't do this alone. Sometimes we need that person there to help us zoom out and look at the whole picture so we can see the whole map not just where we're standing on the map. So we can understand that we are heading somewhere and that we can change the direction of where we are heading to where we want to head and how. My friends, you are more powerful than you know. You are more powerful than you are giving yourself credit for. Don't let food have the power over you. You have the power over it. You are so powerful in that relationship, my friend, but you are giving your power to the food. Okay? You are more powerful than you know. And I know that the relationship with the body and food can feel scary to look at and to try and shift and to make it a relationship of love and power. But let me or another coach help you walk through that, that process into that relationship that you want with food and your body. Let me help you walk through it with confidence, clarity, love, and compassion, because that's what I'm here for. That's what you're here for is to be in that relationship with confidence, clarity, love, and compassion. All right? That's all I have for you all this week. Leave me your thoughts, your questions, your comments, your concerns in the comments. Hit me up on social media. Send me an email. Hit me up on my website. All of that information is linked in the show notes. Guys, I want to open up this conversation. So if something I said here struck something in you and you want to talk about it, whether it's because you feel like something isn't right or whether it's like, oh my God, that's totally me and I, I, I want help with this, hit me up. I'm here to discuss this with you, my friends. I'm here to help you get that clarity. So hit me up. Don't be afraid to get help with this. All right? I love you all so, 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 so much. I'll talk to you next week. Ciao. Hey, thank you for listening in this week. I hope you enjoyed the content of this episode. If you did, please subscribe or follow this podcast to receive the newest episodes every week as I bring them to you here on the Connect Your Health to Life coaching channel. Ratings, reviews, and comments are always appreciated. These allow me to know more of what my listeners would like in the podcast and allow for more people who may be searching for a podcast just like this one to find the Connect Your Health to Life coaching channel. If you would like more information about me and the work that I do with my clients one-on-one, then please visit my website at www.slch.ch. Again, that is www.slch.ch. You can also find me on social media on Instagram at SethLusk underscore coaching. Again, that is SethLusk underscore coaching. And on Facebook in my free Facebook group community called A Healthy Life Connection. We would love to have you in the group, and it's only three membership questions that you have to answer to join. And again, it's entirely free. And if you need any further information or just want to say hello, feel free to send me an email directly at slusk.health at slch.ch. Again, that is slusk.health at slch.ch. Thank you again so much for listening, and I look forward to our next time together. Ciao.